Hello and welcome to the 28th episode of the Meet the Vidya Vatan series. Today in the episode, we have a very special guest from Canada. She is someone who is a producer, filmmaker, speaker, and a film administrator. During her career, she has nurtured several film talents all across the globe. So before I present her detailed biography, may I first welcome Ms. Judy Gladstone to the show. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Judy, for joining us today. My pleasure. Such an honor having you on the show. So before we formally start the show, may I uh, first read the you know detailed biography of uh, Ms. Gladstone. Gladstone has served as CEO of a new streaming platform Canadian for the Canadian filmmakers, and she has been the executive director of the Documentary Organization of Canada. She has nurtured several film talents from all across the globe as the executive director of Brow Effect, which is foundation to assist Canadian talents, commissioning thousands of feature uh, short films. These films have been celebrated at the film festivals with honors, including Prix de Jury de Cannes, an Academy Award nomination, an Emmy, a nomination for an International Emmy, and a BAFTA. Gladstone has been invited to speak at industry events, including uh, the Fiki Frames in Chennai, Ifi Goa, and Lincoln Center, New York, Film Forum Paris, and Film Markets in Cannes and Rio de Janeiro. Gladstone ran a Canadian International Development Agency, which is CDI program in Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel. She has served as the cultural attache at the Embassy of Canada in Israel and Palestine territories. She is presently working as co-producer on several film projects and is directing a feature land documentary. So may I now request with Judy to kindly deliver her talk on key to success in the films. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have any you know, extraordinary insight in what are the keys to success, but I'll share what I've seen um, both in terms of mistakes and uh, qualities that have helped filmmakers launching their careers or even in mid-career. Um, uh, and some things repeat themselves time and time again. It's um, not enough to simply have talent. Of course, without talent, one goes nowhere. But um, a lot of us have wonderful ideas, exciting ideas and talent, but without the persistence and without the ability to have a team around us to help us achieve our vision, that talent is going to remain un, uh, unexpressed, unfulfilled. It won't end up, your ideas won't end up on the screen. Um, So it's really important to remember, and I think it's it's the same in many film, you know, many disciplines. One can be, you know, brilliant at, at a particular discipline in science. That doesn't mean that you're going to end up being um, a no name in your field if you don't have the other qualities that it takes to um, work as a group, as a team in a lab, uh, to get your work published, etc. So you have to be, you have to recognize that um, what it takes to succeed and be honest with yourself as to where your particular talents lie. In order to make a film, of course, um, one needs uh, a group. Um, the, the, the script has to be as best as it can be. If it's not on the paper, it's not going to end up on the screen. So whatever you have in your head has to be expressed on paper. And the actors have to be of the caliber to express what you're writing. When one is pitching to potential funders, the, the person with the idea, who created the concept, who perhaps wrote the script, um, the driving creative for it might not be the best person to meet with potential funders. So you, again, you have to recognize where your abilities lie. And if you know that you come across as shy, meek, quiet, perhaps not so self-confident, or perhaps 
you come across as uh, sometimes as being very aggressive because you're so passionate about your idea and that people back off, it actually turns them off. Then, you know, look at yourself, recognize that, and go to those meetings with a partner, perhaps a, a co-producer, an executive producer, who has natural charisma and who's passionate about your project. And I'm not saying to erase yourself from the picture. I'm saying let that other person who has natural charisma be the speaker, be the spokesperson. So think of it as casting for a film. You choose the best person to portray the role. The same when you're going into a meeting, an important meeting. Select who should be speaking about what aspects of the project and let that person speak, give them the freedom. And be present. If it's your project, if it's you're the one riding the bus, um, but you can take a back seat in the sense of um, presenting the project if you know this other person's going to do a better, better job. Um, something that I experienced a lot um, was filmmakers coming to me with concepts where they would spend an inordinate amount of time pitching the reason why it was important for them to make the film. And it was always, you know, heart-wrenching, um, very personal reasons, but they weren't telling me what the viewer was going to see on the screen, what the viewer was going to hear. They were telling me why they wanted to make the film. Somebody in their family had been very ill and somebody had, they knew had, uh, and, and endured a terrible tragedy. And in their sleep, this vision came to them that the way to honor this, this person was to make a film. But that wasn't what the film was going to be about. The concept of the film was left very nebulous and they were putting all their energy into telling me the what was motivating them to make the film. But that isn't going to persuade, I don't think any funder or any uh, anybody that you're looking to have, have them join your project, um, the why. What people want to know is not why you want to make the film. You keep the why for once the film is made and you're doing the media circuit, uh, then you tell people why you wanted to make this film. People want to know what. What is going to be the story? What is going to take place? Um, and as much information that you already know about, about that, that you can share. And, and of course the rights, it's not enough to say that uh, you're going to have a famous uh, composer uh, create an original sound score for you. You need to show proof that you're in contact with that composer or with their agent and that they've agreed. Um, so there's no point bluffing anybody you're going to meet is going to check into it and you're going to immediately lose credibility uh, if you say something which is based on uh, your, you know, your wishes as opposed to an actual fact. Um, in my experience, the, the projects that end up succeeding and touching people uh, the most are the ones that have an element of surprise. Really, um, there's the kind of tried and true formula of a fish out of water. Um, but but, but a, a film that takes a detour along the way and where, the, um, where perhaps there's several surprises to the audience that they think they know what's about to happen next, but no, um, the detour is taken. And um, the... Our, our countries, of course, are extremely different, the, and therefore the industries are very different. And how film is financed uh, in India is, of course, it's, it's different than here in Canada. But some things apply, you know, are, are universal in how um, talent is recognized and how talent uh, needs to be combined with persistence, uh, the importance of uh, having a team. Uh, sometimes people, teams are created in film school. A writer meets a director, 
uh, producer, and they go on afterwards and work together. And um, th those those relationships are, can be all important. I mean, you could graduate film school and never see your film uh, you know, cohorts again um, and go on and be very successful. Uh, you can move somewhere completely different. Um, but, but oftentimes I've seen is that these groups, the people who met at this uh, important development uh, stage in their life, they go on and they, they respect each other and they solidify the relationship and it flourishes and one complements the other. And perhaps at some point they break off and each goes their own way. But at that important point of proving themselves and creating works um, to showcase their talents and having a portfolio, and creating a name for themselves is done with people that they met um, quite early on. As in anything in life, it's so important not to build, burn bridges, but to build bridges. The, um, I, you know, it can't be overstated the importance of being, um, uh, you know, having a certain elegance and politeness uh, when you meet with somebody and perhaps uh, saying something so that they remember you. And then you never know down the line when you might want to reach out to them. And then that little thing that you might have said, that joke that made them laugh, that uh, anecdote that you shared with them that created a link between you, um, the fact that you were able to let them know uh, you had seen work that they were in, you know, whatever memory you create when you reach out to them, perhaps by sending an email and you remind them of, the, of that meeting, um, uh, you know, that can open doors. So um, I know what the, the impact it's had on me when people sometimes actually literally have opened a door for me and then use that moment to keep walking with me and um, uh, repeating their name. And afterwards, when they reached out, I was able to connect and remembered, oh, that was that fine individual who was uh, so charming. And it has an impact, these little gestures. Um, there's no excuse nowadays when one meets with somebody not to be uber prepared, super prepared. You cannot, in my opinion, do too much homework before a meeting. And when you're meeting with, whether it's, you know, a casting agent, a potential funder, uh, somebody you want to come on board your project in whatever capacity, uh, to show up at the meeting, uh, whether it's a Zoom meeting, a face meeting, a phone meeting, and to simply say, I heard good things about you, let me tell you about my project, is not the same as being able to start off the meeting and say, I saw this work you did. Um, I read what you wrote. Um, I know I've seen the other projects that you, you financed. I think, think so highly of your taste. You clearly know which projects to support. I'm ha having, uh, being able to connect in that fashion with the person no matter how important the person is, how experienced they are, they are a person. And all of us like to be recognized um, for uh, ourselves and not just being um, somebody who rubber stamps or, you know, an ATM machine, uh, somebody who just signs checks and gives up money. We want to be recognized for people who... Um, have our own talent. So even if we're not the filmmaker and you're coming to us to help make your film, you're the filmmaker, but recognize that we um, cherish ourselves too. And if you recognize something in us that, um, that we see as one of our qualities, you're creating a bond that is so important and many times uh you know there's one degree of separation between me and somebody else you and somebody else and if you're you know focused on who you want to reach and meet um and the the more contacts you have and the more strong contacts you have and you maintain those contacts 
and you send out little notes, then you ask how they're doing, and you wish them Happy New Year, and do those little things. Uh, you just don't know when a particular contact might come handy. So nourish those connections. Um, you're attending a film festival. Look and see who will be there and who is somebody who you'd like to meet or you think down the road you'd like to pitch a project to and study their resume, uh, try to see what they've been involved in uh, in the past, look at their photos. And so when you see them, that you're able to go up and introduce yourself and then say something about their work, uh, make it you know, personal and um, see if you can change contact information. Um, and uh, and whether you stay in touch with Facebook or whichever other fashion. The, the reality of what's going on today with the pandemic, of course, has greatly affected uh, the industry worldwide. Um, in Canada, um, our, our lockdown has been lifted. Um, and, it's happening regionally. Uh, things aren't the same in every part of the country. Um, so there are some productions that have started again of independent film. The, besides the protocols in place of uh, taking temperature every day, you know, having a full-time medic on staff, um, um, monitoring oxygen, um, every day of everybody that's coming on set, wearing masks on set, outdoors, indoors. Um, the, the, the biggest hurdle, besides the, you know, adhering to the protocols, is that the insurance won't cover COVID. So the filmmakers have to find um, private funding to set aside if COVID um, strikes the set and they have to shut down before production is complete, that money um, uh, is coming from their pocket. Um, whereas otherwise in Canada, these particular productions that are going ahead have been successful in raising money from the funds that exist here. But those funds are, are willing to compensate for the extra cost of having the medic on set and, you know, uh, all that's involved, um, but not for uh, the cost of being prepared for the possibility that everybody hopes to avoid of having to shut down early. Um, and that ends up being a substantial uh, percentage of the budget, actually. It's not insignificant. So right now, that's the hurdle stopping production from going ahead in Canada. People are tweaking their scripts so that actors aren't too close to each other. They're thinking of all kinds of ways of creating bubbles so people are doing self-isolation during the shoot. You know, there's all kinds of solutions in place except for the insurance, that there is no insurance willing to cover uh, COVID. Um, and so that's where we're at. So, so we are hearing the other production here and there that's starting up. Um, in terms of our industry in Canada, we're very, um, um, a lot of people get to cra practice their craft, um, DOPs and actors. Um, uh, everybody who's involved, um, you know, below the line actually on set. We have very big studios in Toronto and Vancouver for American productions. The Americans bring in a lot of money they bring in state-of-the-art cameras. Um, they bring in their own writers, uh, their own directors, and their own producers. But they use Canadian talent. Um, the stars will be American, but they'll use Canadian talent and um, on camera and definitely behind the camera. Um, and it's cost-effective because our dollar is, uh, you know, 70% of the American dollar right now. Um, and has been something close to that for quite a, quite a number of years. But Americans are not allowed to cross the border. Our border is closed because of COVID. And, and once again, there's the issue of uh, insurance. 
So, um, so a tiny percentage, a tiny, tiny percentage of productions are happening compared to usual. What people are doing with the uh, extra time on their hands is writing and reaching out and exploring ideas and getting ready for when the health conditions allow for production to hit uh, with, you know, a full steam ahead. So uh, actually work is going on on uh, building new studio because the, um, um, the assumption actually is that even more work is going to be coming to Canada once the situation allows. Um, uh, COVID is being handled in Canada much better than in the States. The statistics are much better. So as much as the countries are similar, um, the governments are very different. So things are being handled quite differently. Um, perhaps our population also is somewhat different and we um, it's easier for Canadians to take direction. So that's what I can share about what's going on right now. Um, and I don't know um, if some folks have chimed in with the particular issues they'd like to focus on as well. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Judy, for sharing such important insight about this important topic, uh, how to success in, in film, basically. And I think many of the filmmakers, you know, when they begin their career, they, they don't have any clue, you know, how to sort of make big in this, uh, you know, very complex uh, industry, you know, which is sort of combination of so many skilled workers, actually. So you very rightly, you raised this, you know, very important point, you know, how to develop this networking and how to build your relations. And, you know, definitely content is the king and you have to have a strong content, then only people can come together. Thank you so much for joining these important sites. So we will take up now audience questions. Uh, uh, quite a lot of questions have come. And uh, the people who know you already, they have sort of wished you. Uh, like uh, Sujata, she says, good to connect uh, with uh, Miss Judy Gladstone, an outstanding uh, filmmaker producer from Canada. And she says, uh, warm welcome to you, madam. And then uh, uh, we have first question from uh, Shante Passons, uh, she says, you know, uh, like uh, the, the uh, thing which we're talking about just few minutes before. So like uh, based on building a team, it seems as, you know, though networking is crucial. So what are your thoughts, any tips on that? You know, how to build networking while you are in, into filmmaking? Well, uh, I think a wonderful example is uh, how I was invited by Rizwan today because we met uh, when he was running uh, If You Go On, and he was extremely busy at the time, um, like when I showed up and the festival was going on. Um, but he took the time to uh, stick his head in in the room where I was um, leading a master class. Or, um, and, and here you go, uh, uh, years go by, and um, uh, he's in a new position, and he's in the, come up with this beautiful concept of um, bringing in people from around the world. And that's networking. I think if um, when I met Rizwan, if I had been um, cold, uh, rude, um, uh, took, decided to use my precious few minutes with him to complain about, um, I don't know, uh, uh, lack of air conditioning, uh, whatever I could have invented to complain about, um, if I just was in the mood to be, you know, um, a Westerner in India, that things aren't going exactly smoothly. Uh, Rizwan perhaps wouldn't have, uh, you know, would have in his mind moved on and not kept me there and uh, somewhere in the back of his head and brought me on. So in terms of networking, it's, um, some people are very methodical about it and they think, you know, they, they actually, you know, you can write it down. What I need for my project is a really great editor, let's say, uh, uh, and start thinking where and how are the best places to find a great editor. Or perhaps it's that you'd like to direct, but you don't have a script. So look at recent films that were done, if talking low budget. Um, in, in India and see where did those scripts come from? 
did the director indeed write them or did they commission them? Were they an adaptation of a book? Is there a, a book that you really like that perhaps could be adapted and you know and be magical on screen? I mean, depending on what your needs are, you know, identify what your needs are and then from there, uh, I, like I think coming today and attending something like this is is part of networking in of, in of itself, right? Um, and then if somebody like was one can be of assistance to you, you can reach out and you can say, hey, you know, sir, I was such a pleasure participating in th this talk that you did with Judy and the other one with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and, so. and you'll show him that you invested the time, that you really appreciate the um, these sessions that he's uh, taken the, the time and the effort to put together with people from around the globe. And, and and right away you have a link with him. And then you can proceed to ask, does he know somebody specifically for what you're looking for? You know, uh, can, can he spare half an hour to brainstorm with you over a Zoom meeting? You know, so being here today and asking this question and making your name known, is already networking. I mean, I know people who, uh, very high achieving people, who make it a point when they go to any meeting, any any public event, they always raise their hand and ask a question simply so that uh, they can say kind of what you just did now, say their name, state their position, and ask. The question doesn't have to be terribly brilliant, but they've got to stand up there's 500 people in the space, a thousand people, you know, they stood up, the mic was passed to them, they said their name, they said their title, they looked around, and then when there's the coffee break, the lunch break, everybody's leaving, you know, only three, four people get to chime in, and we recognize them. And, and there's, you know, so the rest of us are all anonymous. The person that stood up, took the mic, said their name, said who they were, asked whatever question it was, now there's a reason to go over and start a conversation. Because the rest of you know, and you'll see that people gravitate to them um, because the rest of us were too quiet, shy, didn't get to the mic first, and uh, we remain anonymous. So there's a little bit of a talent in in knowing how to put yourself out there, and make people notice you. But in terms of networking, just knowing people for the sake of knowing people is fun. You can name drop at. Uh, you know, and together with your friends, you know, so-and-so, you know, so-and-so. But if you want the networking to lead to a particular result, you have to define what you're looking for. Who is it that you need on your team? Who do you need in your corner? Who do you want? Is Are you looking for a mentor who's going to be willing to look at your script or, you know, look at your budget or give you ideas of where you can money? I mean, it depends what you're looking for. Identify, break it down. Be methodical. It's like anything else. If somebody's starting a business, uh, you know, they they have a clear list of what they're looking for. And it's the same with film. It's not doesn't just happen. You don't just take a paintbrush and boom, there's a film. I think very well said, uh, Shantru. I'm sure your question is well answered. Uh, and in, in her talk as well, uh, Judy said, you know, I think film festivals are the best places, you know, where you meet a lot of talents, you know, at, at a single place. So um, I think all the budding filmmakers who, and in fact, the, the established filmmakers also, they do visit, you know, several film festivals. So they sort of see a lot of, you know, good stuff uh, coming from different parts of the world at a particular place. And they meet a lot of, you know, wonderful talents at, at, a, at a place and you discuss a lot of ideas with them. So Judy rightly said in her talk as well, you know, uh, film festivals are the ideal place for all budding filmmakers. You know, you have to be there. You you need to visit because you get so many ideas. You meet so many personalities there, and you do so much, so so much of networking in, in these places. And then Shantnu has uh, has another question, follow up question. She says, you know, you mentioned pitching and filmmakers telling the why rather than what. I wanted to know if you could mention anything else one should mention during a pitch that might be what funders might be looking for. I think a very important question. Um, when meeting with the funders, of course, you want to know, um, you, you know, if you have the opportunity to actually meet with them. 
whether it's uh, Zoom or uh, face to face. Um, again, you know, homework. So no, tr try to know, or and if you don't already know, if it's a little vague for you, try to get them to speak first about what they're interested in. Um, and um, if, if they're people who have been funding uh, film in the past, what has brought them the most satisfaction? And the satisfaction can be financial reward, or maybe they're simply, um, say simply, but perhaps um, um, just to recoup their investment, but also to have been able to go on the red carpet at a festival somewhere, to them that was extremely exciting and rewarding. And so they're not looking necessarily to make a profit, they're looking to recoup their investment and have an awesome experience, you know, that stays with them. I mean, each, each funder, it depends, um, because uh, who you're approaching and, you know, is it private? Is it a, an organization? Is it a foundation? So you know who you're speaking to, but um, certainly the, I think everybody will appreciate if you'll be concise, um, if you'll be able to, um, um, you know, give really an elevator pitch, meaning it takes as long as an elevator ride, uh, so be as concise as possible um, to give them an idea and then wait and hear their feedback. Because my suggestion would be to try, if you're starting with a meeting, is not necessarily to come with your script and leave it with them, but rather um, come with a two-page description, your resume, the resumes of all the important people involved in your project, um, uh, some photos, some photos that give an idea of the, the look that you're aiming for in the film, but so that you're able to take away any input, any feedback that they have that you might want to then go back and revise. Because if it turns out that they say, um, I will never put money in something that has, uh, I don't know, nudity, something that is horror, something that's not appropriate to 12 year olds. You know, I want, I'm interested, you know, maybe you can go back and tweak your film without losing your artistic integrity and and take those, you know, and come back to them and then, you know, and simply say, I'll send you the script and go back and quickly adjust things so that um, uh, if it works for your particular concept, that it can be family friend friendly or you don't have to have full nudity. It can be implied. It can be, you know, uh, sensual without, you know, whatever the purpose of the nudity was. So perhaps you can, you know, twist and turn um, while respecting your concept, but being able to raise the money to actually create your, your concept. Because having a brilliant concept but never being able to create it is just so frustrating, uh, you know. So it takes uh, it takes a small village and it takes the funding, right? Uh, so you, you need to be able to. So the and, and and that's what I'm saying. When since you want to get the other side to talk more than you're talking, and when you talk, you want every word to count. You want it to be really memorable for them. And that's why, in my opinion, they don't, at that, at that stage of the game, when you're looking for financing, um, I don't think it's necessary to spend, to dwell on why. What is, you know, the it's they want to know what is the actual project. And if it turns out they're terribly interested and the conversation goes on and on, and they ask you, how did you come up with this idea? Then you can back to this and this happened in my personal life and this led me uh, this is how I came up with this idea so I hope that's helpful I'm sure Shante your question is well answered uh, now we have another question from Kamal Abdul Nasir he says uh, documentary as a John is now following the same structure as feature films so what do you think sorry uh, my is now following the same structure as a feature film. What do I think? Um, that 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 the creative 
the creative uh, play we're seeing in documentaries? Is that? Yeah, I think he's asking that, you know, uh, documentary has a fiction element also nowadays. So this is no more the, you know, like, you know, a standard documentary format, which used to be like, you know, a voiceover based or the, or the documentary based on the fact, which is shot on the real locations. So a lot of fiction element is also there in the documentary. So it looks like, you know, feature films actually. Which title? Can you share a title of one that looks that looks like a feature? Because I, I agree that documentaries are absolutely going off um, in all directions now. Uh, in Canada, a number of years ago, uh, there's one directed by uh, Sarah Polly. Mm -hmm. uh, she's well known as an actress, and she directed a documentary about her family, her, her nuclear family. And she went and researched who her biological father was. She realized uh, after she was a successful actress that uh, she, she no longer believed that her the father who had raised her was her biological father. Right. And um, mother had passed when she was twelve. She she did this beautiful documentary, and she did something that I see now is being repeated in other documentaries. That uh, in my experience, she was the first one to do it. She played with the audience. She kept showing us home video footage of her mother when her mother was alive and Sarah was little. And it was very believable. We thought it was home video footage. And those of us from Toronto who knew the actress in the home video footage, clued in earlier than others who didn't recognize her. So some people only at the end of the film when you're studying the credits realize every single bit of home video footage that she used was fake. It was footage that she shot with actors for the documentary. It didn't make the documentary look like a fiction fixture film. It just plays, played with the format of what is a documentary, how far can you push the envelope and still be documentary that's telling a story, but using uh, new tools at hand. Um, and so the, I've seen this now being repeated in other, in other films. I'm thinking of doing it myself and toying with the idea. Um, if you're trying to recreate something, you're, you know, you're, the story that you're telling, there's parts of it took place decades and decades ago. You don't have any footage from that era. And instead of relying on a few stills that you have or stock footage or filling the space with a talking head, perhaps use actors and equipment from that era or, you know, try to recreate, you know, new shaky black and you know. And, um, and it just makes a smoother experience for the viewer, like they really feel they're in that era of the 1950s or the 1970s or the 1980s, you know. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what the question is, but definitely I think that the whole format of documentary is very exciting because there's all these possibilities. We're bringing in animation, um, but I can't think of a documentary that I, that I saw that felt like I was watching a fiction feature film. I still feel to me like I'm watching a documentary. Um, I'm just excited that they're, um, the format has kind of exploded and, uh, and I think that's been for quite a while now that, you know, you don't have to tell the story starting at the beginning and just, you know, going along. You can start at any stage and circle back and jump forward. Yeah, it can be narrative or non-narrative. I'm sure, Kamal, you know, that was the sort of, you know, gist of your question. Uh, this question is well answered. Uh, if you have further question, I think you can uh, further write the questions. So we will take another question now. The another question is uh, from Sujata. She's from Hyderabad, India. Uh, she says, what about the diasporic community uh, in Canada? Could you uh, make any film on their issues as a native of Canada filmmaker? Uh, can Canadians make films on any issues? Or can Canadians make films about the diaspora? I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, Obed, please uh, put up the question. Let the question be here. As a native, uh, yes, um, Canadians make films. First of all, not, not everything is shot in Canada. 
uh, even when receiving uh, funding, since we are fortunate and there is some public funding available, um, doesn't mean that the film has to be shot in Canada or on Canadian subject. Um, the restriction is that the core team has to be Canadian. So you're not going to receive public funding uh, to make a film as a director, as a producer, you know, the editor, etc. Th they need to be Canadian. Um, but the subject can be really anything goes. Um, and we have some wonderful uh, films that have been shot uh, in India um, or uh, as if in India, like in Sri Lanka, by Deepa Mehta, for example, you know. So, um, um, no shortage. We also have uh, film festivals uh, for the diaspora Indian uh, community here, which is quite significant. I imagine the uh, person asking the question is well aware. And um, they're very well attended, you know, huge numbers of people. Um, so very significant diaspora Indian community. And uh, they're making films. They're making films um, here about all kinds of subjects, not just about not necessarily related to the fact of uh, their heritage. Uh, but there is a lot of talent um, uh, everywhere. Um, a, a film that keep, that's being explored here too on film um, by people um, uh, from the part of the diaspora Indian community is the issue of um, 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 genre uh, of um, genders. In India, they're going back and looking at um, why they, they want to explore the issue of why so much violence against women in India. So that's something that um, uh, uh, you know funding is limited, um, but but I know uh, there's several projects kind of vying for the same funding, uh, addressing the theme from different uh, perspectives. Um, so you know, it's a vibrant, vibrant uh, community, the uh, diaspora Indian community, and uh, more than one film festival. And when you're able to travel and come and visit, do let me know. Uh, these film festivals are awesome, and they take tend to take some of them take place back to back with the New York uh, Indian Film Festival. So it's possible to bring your film there, and then come to the festivals here. Yeah. We have yeah. in Toronto, uh, besides TIFF, we have the second most important documentary film festival in the world, Hot Dogs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very popular indeed. Hot Dogs is a very important festival. Uh, she has further, you know, two more questions. Uh, she further says, have you got any plans to make pandemic-based films uh, in and around world or exclusively in Canada? If so, on what issues you would like to address? Um, I'm glad so. um, mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm not personally working on anything directly related to the pandemic at this point in time. I think um, 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 I think other people are, um, certainly in terms of the documentary aspect. Um, I think what we'll see is, um, you know, in the next year or two when films come out, we'll simply know what time a particular scene in a film took place because uh, the uh, actors on screen are going to be wearing masks, just like we can date a film by what, uh, uh, how old the uh, mobile is that they're holding in their hands or, you know, um, uh, what the MacBook looks like. Um, we'll be able to go, oh, yeah, that must have been during the pandemic. They're all wearing masks. Um, the, um, you know, I have an idea for a very short film. Right. That's dear to my heart at the moment. Um, but, um, and sometimes shorts can, you know, travel virally and, you know, uh, be seen. Um, whether I'm actually going to sit down and, and make it's a different story. It's, it's, it's in here. It's in here and it's in my iPhone. <laughs> um, but um, 
I don't know people who are right now working on scripts directly about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, a lot of filmmakers would be working on this important issue because uh, I know one of the important filmmakers in India, uh, Mr. Vinod Kapri, uh, he has won National Film Award in India twice, actually. Uh, he has shot, you know, very important documentary, how the, you know, uh, these daily laborers were sort of, you know, struck in, in metros who are working as daily wages. And, you know, after 30, 40 days, they migrated to their villages, actually, from metros, covering, you know, more than 200 uh, kilometer distance uh, on foot. So there were no vehicles uh, available for them. So they started walking on foot, you know, more than 200, 300 kilometers to their home. So he actually traveled with them, the kind of difficulty they faced. So this is, again, a very important pandemic issue which you know the people face in india i'm sure you know the country like canada would be having a different issue related to pandemic and, and filmmakers would have can those issues as well so sujata she raised a very important point and uh, she further she she says you know my sister is raised uh, with her family in toronto she praises and love canada a lot ma'am gladstone i think the work is done on uh, online from home how the production is taking place how the technical staff are taking care post COVID-19. So she's basically asking, you know, post COVID-19, how is going to be, you know, filmmaking scenario? Actually, this was my question as well. well as I said, I don't know, like in terms of the big American productions that we're waiting to return. Um, but right now there are productions, as I said, going on. I have my colleagues and friends working on them. The, um, there's uh, there needs to be uh, a full-time medic on staff as everybody arrives their temperature is taken and their oxygen saturation level is checked um, they they need to wear masks on set and the set whether it's outdoors or indoors the masks uh, all day on set um, the whole craft services the food is very different than it was before uh, and Portions are individually wrapped and brought in and no sharing. Um, um, so everything is regimented. Uh, the distance between actors and having them not breathe on each other is, uh, you know, so love scenes and that kind of thing. It's um, how the angles of the cameras are set up. Um, our, our restrictions were just lifted here in terms of the number of people that can be indoors at the same time. So um, we can have 50 people indoors at the same time. So that's sufficient to allow that the lighting people don't have to leave before they th they were playing. But the lighting people would come in, set the lights, you know, dummies, and and then leave. And then the actors would come in, and um, 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 uh, the actors need to mic, uh, mic themselves. There isn't somebody touching them. You know, there's 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 definitely adjustments. As I said before, one of the biggest adjustments is financial, since uh, nobody is giving insurance. If somebody does come down with COVID on set, uh, there is no insurance to cover the cost of having to shut down production. We have national health coverage here. It's not, um, this isn't India and this isn't the United States. It's two important distinctions. So unlike the United States, we have national health coverage for everybody. So if somebody's sick, it's not that the production is going to have to cover their, God forbid, their medical costs, whether they have to be home and it's you know, relatively mild or whether they end up in hospital, their medical costs will be covered. The, the, the insurance is, the concern is um, the cost of having to shut down production. Because if somebody gets sick, everybody has to go into quarantine. And, and you know, and the whole production is, you know, everything's topsy-turvy. It has to be shut down. So that's where you know, private money needed to be raised. And a significant, uh, not, not, uh, not a symbolic amount of money, a significant amount of money had to be raised and set aside, not just... Oh yeah, yeah, we'll have it if we need it. You know, the money had to be um, handed over, and it'll be given back if the production is, makes it to the end of August. It's been shooting for a week now, without uh, COVID. 
Um, so, so yeah, so it is an issue. Um, but in Ontario, we are at stage three, so things are, are open. And so this is an Ontario production. Um, many of the key personnel are very close, and they were in a bubble before working on it. Yes, so I mean, when you ask about pandemic, from, just personally, I'm not involved right now in the making of any. Um, people uh, across Canada were invited um, at no cost to do a short film, about five minutes or so. So 25 people across the country at the beginning of the quarantine when we were in isolation at home. Uh, filmmakers took took their phones or whatever camera they had on hand and made beautiful little films um, that were commissioned by um, a programmer. And um, he didn't have any money to offer them, but simply the opportunity. And they've been shared online and people have been enjoying them. And they've been... As you can see the, the the sharp, you know, such sharp disparities between our two countries. You know, they're about the loneliness and isolation of being at home. Um, um, a young uh, fourteen-year-old did for a school assignment in June. Um, she's uh, um, already has her eyes set on being a filmmaker, so she did a school assignment. Uh, and she chose to do a short film as her school assignment. And she set up her camera on a tripod at the foot of her bed, and everything shot in her bedroom because that's where she was doing all her classes online and her homework and sleeping. And her bedroom was everything. And she shot herself day after day, and you see her, you know, or it looks like day after day, she kept changing her clothes. Um, you see her mood... Uh, you know, how it affected her emotionally, not being able to see her friends, uh, right. not being seeing the teachers, not doing, not being allowed out of the house, just doing everything online on the computer. So even though it was in the luxury of a middle-class house in a relatively safe city like Toronto, um, the emotional, mental toll came through very clear and was very short, very well done film by this 14-year-old who, um, you know, got so much attention, right? It's because it's, it's so it touched us all and, and woke people up to the reality of even somebody with all those comforts, the toll it's taken. You know, we don't know in a few years how these young kids are going to turn out. We know the suffering of the migrant workers. The New York Times is doing a very, uh, I think, important job of covering it for us in the West of uh, the horror. Um, uh, of it all and, and the, on the ongoing ramifications, the suffering and death that happened on this self, you know, enforced, I don't know, kind of march um, back home without food, water, you know, and, and the generosity of the people who set up, you know, try to set up feeding the station for them. But it's obviously not everybody. Um, um, and and then the families were shattered because they were relying on the income of these migrant workers. So the ramifications, you know, it, it continues. You know, it's 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 an, there must be a gazillion stories right, uh, in India uh, of of the generosity of some who are going out of their way to to share and help, the callousness of others, and the untold suffering. Yes, I hope people are capturing as much of that as possible in real time. Very well said. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I would just want to know from you if the pandemic is sort of forcing us towards the minimalism. Uh, because, you know, I, I don't see, you know, now a feature film crew of 200, 300 members, you know, shooting a film. So maybe they will reduce the crew to the maybe 100 or 50 members. Uh, likewise, documentary crew will further be reduced, you know. I don't know if pandemic is sort of forcing us towards the minimalism or not. Uh, that that is going to be scenario, I I think, because the way pandemic is going to stay now, it's just not coming down. Actually, it's it's going to stay. The, the the kind of data we are getting from you know each part of the world, I think, is going to stay for some time. And and we need to sort of change our strategy of filmmaking. Actually, your take, Judy. Yeah, I don't know about the big production. How what what they're planning to do? I mean, we see. You know, Netflix, etc., doesn't have uh, tons of new 
uh, new new sitcoms and that kind of thing coming out. Um, I, I think, you know, um, uh, films that were shot, um, series that were shot, that, you know, people are now able to go back and in post-production and complete them. So, so there will be new content coming out, uh, certainly in English, um, for say, you know, maybe about a year. And then what happens? Um, we see in football, hockey, baseball, uh, one of the things that they're trying to do to keep the, those professions going, they're limiting the number of, um, of games. You know, it's like your cricket or, or hockey or baseball. Um, the, they're trying to create bubbles uh, for each team where if the team only doesn't see their family members and friends and stays together in a bubble and then plays another team, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're trying that. They're trying that. It's, um, it, it's turning out to be difficult mm -hmm. because... Uh, the nature of, of of us people is, you know, we're social, we're social beings, and you finish a game and you, you want to go out and celebrate, um, and it's hard to um, stick to that rule of no, you don't go out and celebrate with anybody else but your teammates. So turning to be, it's turning out to be problematic, but they're trying, and perhaps that's one way that um, films. Uh, will happen, as you say, with reduced numbers, is that if everybody is in isolation, um, you know, in quarantine, and they're what we call a bubble, and then they can be together and without masks, right? It's like an extended family. Uh, and if they got through two weeks together and nobody got sick, it presumably means that either they're all asymptomatic or simply there is no over there in that bubble, you know, if they all do the swab before, you know. Um, so it would take a lot of self-discipline uh, uh, and trust, you know, that nobody's going to sneak out and cheat uh, and, and stay together for the duration of the project. But um, I would think it's possible. It's a question of what's the project, you know, how many locations are involved, um, what kind of travel is involved. And how people, how the, how the actors feel about it. You know, at the end of the day, I think um, often it's going to be the actors most at risk, um, right. right? In terms of the proximity to right. the other, so uh, you know th they need the most uh, assurance. But if they're not, you know, these huge expensive productions of thirty million dollars, or <laughs> like the you know the small independent productions. Um, right. They're not going to have insurance if whatever they say. If they can't get insurance, I don't see how those productions are going to go back. I know, like I know, production has started up again in in India too for TV shows and right. Okay. But, um, every you know they're doing the same things we're doing here, monitoring everybody's temperature, uh, making sure everybody wears masks, uh, trying to keep people socially distanced, right? Correct. Um, Interesting. Uh, Judy, I think we are almost touching one hour now. So before we close the show, I think I'll, I'll have two more questions and we'll close the show. So I have one question to you. You have had it, you know, one of the important, very famous, uh, this documentary organization you have been the head there. Uh, so what was your take, you know, while deciding the project of different filmmaker? Because you would be receiving so many proposals for the films, actually. So what do you look at the proposals? You know, what exactly? Uh, this this question is from the you know young filmmakers point of view especially you know they send a lot of proposal to different organizations so they have a lot of ambitions you know so being the head of a uh, you know a, a documentary organization you have commissioned so many films so what exactly you look in, into the proposal actually um well just to clarify it's when i met you i was running some a, a national program uh, foundation to assist Canadian talent. Right. Um, it was there that I was commissioning much more than than at Doc, the Document Organization Canada. Um, 
and it wasn't just documentaries. It was uh, fiction and uh, animation and a whole array. And it was a huge privilege um, and very invigorating and exciting for me to be able to see the new talent coming out and see their ideas. Um, the um, what you want to see is is that somebody has a really clear vision um, that they're able to articulate, um, and and that it's um, that that the way that they've written it down, you can you can you can visualize it. It's really clear, and you can, uh, you can sense um, how how how. Um, um, exciting, beautiful, uh, it's going to be how it's different than anything else that was made before. It's similar to other works, but it has a twist, mm -hmm. with, you know, as I was saying, that element of surprise. Um, and, but at the same time, having a great script um, is just part of the puzzle. It's being able to prove that you're going to be able to translate it to the screen and deliver something worthy of that script. Because some people know how to write, but they don't have, know how to come with a great team, you know, how to assemble a team. And so then you look and go, wow, this is a great script. This is a great idea. And then you look at the team and you go, these actors are just not up to snuff. Mm -hmm. just don't have what it takes. People are going to switch to something else. Nobody's going to stay with us. The, the, the DOP is working so terrible. You know, it looks like a five-year-old or something. You know, it just is banal. It's, it's, you know, and so when you go through it and you go, uh, they haven't even thought of the music. They thought of the music, but it's, it doesn't go together or it's, or, you know, so if you want to go through the elements, it's not the script, just having a brilliant script is a great start, of course, because without that, you're not going to look at the rest. It doesn't matter who the actors are. If the script is boring, pathetic, uh, just a repeat of something else, or completely inappropriate, um, you know, it, um, maybe great for a very, very specific genre, people who want to see, um, um, murder and mayhem, but not what you're looking for, which is a story at the beginning, middle, and end. But because if the script is lousy, you don't bother looking at the rest of the package. If the script is brilliant, okay, great. Your heart is, you're all a flutter that you're going to play a role in getting something made that's going to, you know, travel the world and be tremendous and, uh, touch people, but then everybody else in the project has to be of the same caliber. Mm -hmm. You want to see demo reels, you know, you want to see previous work by the actors. They don't have to necessarily be no means, but you want to be able to look at something and say, well, I can tell that they can deliver. And and the same with everybody basically in the project. And then um The what I found was really interesting is that you know, sometimes somebody would come back to me after um, I commissioned one film from them, and it came back, it was delivered, and it was a disappointment. Mm -hmm. it, it was so so, it wasn't you know garbage, but it was not something that was film festival worthy. Mm -hmm. okay? So it was, eh, you know. And then, so it's not somebody I would rush to want to commission again, but they would come back to me. And I'd be like taking a deep breath. And they'd say, whether it was a meeting or whether they had the opportunity to meet with me in person, either way, uh, but this happened several times. They'd say, we know or I know what I did wrong with the previous film, and I'm not going to repeat that mistake. They would say it first, 
they wouldn't have to put me in the position because I, I wasn't running a film school. Just, you know, although in some ways, uh, but they would say, I know, I recognize, I, um, I'm not going to do it. You know, I learned from it. I'm not going to do it again that way. And that meant that completely changed how I, you know, my willingness to look at the new proposal, you know. So instead of trying to, you know, feel like I have to put my armor up and not fall, you know, be, be strong and be clear and transparent and let them know, sorry, gave you a chance once, you know, maybe you should be looking at a different career or knock on somebody else's door. Once they said that, it's totally disarming because you sense it's, it's true. It was exactly the same criticisms that I had and why I thought I wasn't going to fund any more of their work. But if they were able to recognize where they had gone wrong, where the weaknesses were, why it had, in essence, failed, you know, certainly not lived up to its potential, and said, but now this is how I'm going to work on this new, look at this new idea, and this is how, and those people, I'm so excited to share, have gone on to have stellar careers. They're at the top of the game right now in Canada, you know? And so they were able to recognize uh, what had, where they had, you know, fallen, where they had mm -hmm. failed, articulate it clearly. We didn't have to have, you know, it wasn't, a, we didn't have to do psychotherapy. They just explained it calmly, with regret, sincerely, without my having to say it. I just had to agree. <laughs> you know, they made it simple for me. Instead of me trying to tell somebody what's wrong with their work and are they willing to improve where I see improvements needed. So that's an, I think that's an astonishing gift to be able to do that for any of us in life, to be able to sit down with somebody and say, I failed, but I'm going to do better. I, I can see where I can do better. And, and if only I have the opportunity to show you, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, somebody who can do that and recognize and prove on their work, that's, that's amazing. So if you have a previous film and you're and you and, and that's all you have to show for your work and you know it's not stellar, but that's what you have to show. If you could perhaps just take a few minutes of it, maybe not show the full thing, you know, take the best moments of it, show it to somebody and tell them, listen, I'm not showing you the film project because I myself am disappointed in it. And these are the things I would do going forward but it was a great learning curve i learned so much and you know and articulate what it is you learned and that you now have a team if you do who you work with who you wouldn't work with you know that you're sorry you weren't played didn't play a more important role in the edit you know but going forward you will whatever the issue is was um so make that project that you're disappointed in work for you make it open doors don't just you know, uh, leave it behind. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Interesting, very interesting indeed. Uh, so before we close this show today, I have one last question now. You have sort of executed, you know, one of the important OTT platform in uh, Canada. Uh, so, you know, now we are sort of facing pandemic situation and, you know, most of the filmmaking, film, film weaving is basically happening on, you know, OTT platform nowadays. So, you know, what is your take, you know, is OTT is the future now, future of film viewing? What is going to happen of the, with the cinema halls now? Oh, you mean uh, as opposed to cinemas? Um, yeah. As opposed to TV, for sure. Um, um, because people aren't advertising on television anymore. Um, cinema house, we're in Canada, they're... Uh, we're going, those who are going to see films on the big screen are going to drive-ins. Um, and um, so that's the new kind of game in town. Um, wherever they can, people are opening uh, drive-ins. 
Um, the cinemas um, are still trying to figure out what they're going to do. They're talking mm -hmm. about opening. The government has given them permission to open, but they haven't opened yet because I think it's at 30% capacity. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure what they're planning to do about um, what we what we tended to hear is that they really made their money on selling popcorn and um, <laughs> and the Coca Cola that that's where the profits were. And yes. I think if the audience um, is limited to a, you know thirty percent or whatever percent it would be, and has to wear masks, that might preclude uh, the enjoyment of buying the popcorn. Um, and, and many of our cinemas already had been experiencing the last, you know, slowly, slowly over the last decade, a drop in attendance of uh, young people, the younger demographic, and they started turning the cinemas. Um, they still played films, but they had in the lobbies, you know, video arcades or um, even uh, live performers, jazz singers and um, bowling alleys. You know, they were just trying to find ways to get the young demographic to come to there because they'd already built these you know the venues existed you know the brick and mortar buildings are there so they're trying they've been trying for years to, sure. to navigate and um so i don't think that's going to happen easily you know uh, uh you can't have a jazz performer because singing is one of the live singing is one of the worst ways to propel the virus and uh, you know, how do you play a video game together if you have to have social distancing and somebody wiping down every two seconds, every anything touched, you know? So uh, I, I don't know what's going to be happening. There, were, there it, It's talk, it's chatter. Uh, um, but certainly the drive-in works because you only go to the drive-in with people in your bubble. Right. Um, in some cases, you have to show at the drive-in that the people in the car actually share your same address. Um, I think that moment is loosening up a bit. Um, and you get to see the film and big screen, you know, everything's great, audio, visual. So right now that's how people are seeing on the big screen here. I really don't have a crystal ball that can tell you what's gonna happen. I think the people who own and run the big cinemas are um, in a very, very uncomfortable position. All the independent cinemas in Toronto were shut. It's um, like so many things. It's unknown, and it's um, right now. It's something that's not happening. It's definitely on the back burner. True that. So let us hope for the best. So with this, we have come to the end of the show today. Uh, thank you so much, Judy, for joining us today. It's such a wonderful session on such an important topic. You are giving given us, you know, so many insight about the profession. I'm sure this is going to benefit the viewers and the all you know future budding filmmakers. So I, I should thank you. You have joined us today morning uh, from Canada. It's evening here in India. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. And please share my email address if anybody is who has follow-up questions or comments or criticism. Absolutely, absolutely. You can sort of pronounce your email address. I'll type it also later on. Beautiful. My first name, Judy, J-U-D-Y, at my full name, Judy at judygladstone.com. And um, feel free to share comments that are constructive, productive, informative. If anybody has family here, friends, and uh, you never know what the future will bring, co production, if you're coming to visit, I'd love to stay in touch. Thank you so much, Ruzban, for having thought of me and looking forward to being in touch with you too. Thank you so much, Judy, for joining us today. It's been so wonderful talking to you today. Okay, from Toronto to India. I'm off to hop in a canoe. Ciao, everybody. Bye -bye. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks. So that's it for today's show. Uh, uh, Judy Gladstone was with us. Uh, she has given us, you know, wonderful insight about the uh, profession of cinema, how to success in this film. Uh, next Saturday, uh, we'll be joined by yet another uh, veteran uh, on to 11 a.m. morning, 11.30 a.m. morning. Uh, Saturday, uh, uh, we have Mr. Chaitanya Prasad, the IIS uh, from Ministry of Information Broadcasting. So he would be sharing about the you know uh, rich cultural her heritage about uh, of the cinema, which the director of Film Festival has sort of promoted over the years. So don't forget to join us uh, next Saturday at 11:30 uh, a.m. 
uh, will be joined by uh, Mr. Chetan Prasad, very senior bureaucrat in Ministry of Information Broadcasting. So he'll be sharing very important, uh, you know, facts about the uh, cinematic cinematic journey of, uh, you know, from uh, uh, government organs. Thank you so much for joining us. That's it for today's show. Take good care of you. Uh, uh, I think it's already nine o'clock now. So I'll say uh, good night to all of you. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us.